My name is Mark Shinkarik, and I am the proud principal at the Brawley School. And uh, I'm joined this evening um, with a panel of people that are going to help me tonight with our presentation. Um, so first, I will introduce to you our IB coordinator. This is Liz White. So, Hello. Um, and like I said, Liz is our IB coordinator. She'll tell you a little bit about her position and and uh, in her presentation. And, um, and then I'm joined as well by Lindsay Riebling, who's kind of managing everything in the background here. Um, Lindsay is our data manager. And so if you're going to move forward with an application to our school, um, you will definitely um, receive um, emails. I mean, she's kind of our point person too with any questions, so. And then I also have two students that joined us today. I'll let them introduce themselves to you. Hi, I'm Abby Keaton. And Abby's an eighth grader. Hi, I'm Beckham Sears. Nice to meet you. <laughs> All right. Um, so we'll get started here. Um, uh, welcome this evening. As you know, I've, I've traveled to uh, every uh, feeder elementary school in our district. We're um, fed by five different elementary schools, Woodland Heights, Lake Norman Elementary, Shepherd, uh, Lakeshore, and Cottle Creek. Those are our five feeder elementary schools. Um, and so I believe most of those that are in attendance tonight are probably uh, rising sixth grade, although I do think we have a couple people that might be rising seventh or rising eighth grade, and that's okay too. Um, a lot of the information that we share today will apply to any grade level. Um, and so hopefully uh, we'll talk tonight about our school, give you some general information, talk about what it means to be an IB school, and then uh, discuss our uh, application process so you understand that as well. Okay. So uh, some general information for our school. We, of course, are a middle school here in Iredell State School School. Sometimes we are wrongly uh, identified as a private school or a charter school. We are a free public school operating under the Iredell State School Schools District. Um, and uh, we have been open in this building for two years. This is our second year, so I should probably say a year and a half. And prior to that, um, we were open for over 10 years in the Mount Morn building um, previously. Uh, we serve sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students at our school. Um, we have approximately 586 students at our school. Um, our average class size I put up there is 25. Um, we do have some classes, some of our PE classes that have well over 30 students in them. And then we have a couple of classes like some of our fine arts classes that actually have less than 20 students. So it kind of averages out to about 25 students per class, um, depending on which class it might be a little bit lesser or more than that. Our school day starts at 825 and we dismiss at 305, um, which is I've always uh, shared that we have and that this is kind of my selling point with students is that we have the shortest school day of any middle school in the district um, and it has to do with transportation so yes we do provide transportation to our school um, and i don't want to get too much into transportation since that seems to change every year um, and this year there is talk about maybe adding some more direct routes but in short we have what are called shuttle routes and direct routes uh, some of our students are fortunate enough to have direct routes, uh, which means that the bus picks them up at their home address. Usually those are community stops and then drive them directly to our school and drop them off. Um, there are other stops um, that have to use a shuttle, which means that the bus picks them up at their community stop with other uh, middle school students and then drive them to their home middle school being Lakeshore or Woodland Heights. And then from there, um, they'll take a shuttle bus um, to our school with just students that go to our school. So some students have to do a shuttle and some students have to do a direct route. Um, so it sounds confusing, but we'll certainly, if, you know, when we move forward with this and we get closer to next school year when it's all of this is more pertinent, then uh, we'll certainly make sure you understand and your child understands. So in short, um, you either a shuttle route or a direct route. 
Um, and another misconception sometimes about our school is that we do um, that we don't have sports. In fact, sports is a has has grown to become a large uh, part of our school, and uh, and is one of the things that made it that is really exciting about us being in this new building is because it's it's certainly tailored more for a full middle school experience. In our old building and an old elementary school, we just didn't always have the facilities um, to provide a full middle school experience, and now we do. Um, and it's growing in popularity and we have um, hundreds of students that participate in our school sponsored sports um, every uh, year. All right, um, I put this slide up, um, which I'm uh, extremely proud of and I hope those that are here, our students and staff are also um, proud of. Um, last year, uh, the North Carolina end of grade and end of course combined test results are here from the 2020-21 school year. And um, as you can see there, if we look at schools across the entire state of North Carolina, and these are schools that are sixth through eighth grade schools, just like ours, and understand some school districts um, don't do that. You know, for example, Mooresville graded has a seven, eight middle school. Um, but if we look at just six, eight middle schools across the entire state of North Carolina, and we combine all of the, the end of grade tests, that's the EOC, since we do have some high school courses that we offer, uh, one in particular, Math 1, and then our end of grade test, or EOG scores for math and reading. If we combine all of those scores together, um, and in schools that, that serve six, seventh, and eighth grade students only, um, and we look at the grade level proficiency of students, uh, we have about 90.5% proficient um, across all of those subjects, which places us as the number one performing middle school in the entire state of North Carolina. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, and I think it's something that, that um, should really be uh, um, something that we probably advertise more. Um, but during a, a pandemic, uh, moving buildings, uh, growing in school size, changing our application proce process, which I'll, I'll talk about later in our presentation, um, we still um, are achieving pretty incredible results uh, and, and uh, the best results across the entire state of North Carolina. So I'm going to let you know a little bit about how the middle years program, which we offer, um, fits into the big IB picture. So in the International Baccalaureate, um, we offer the Middle Years Program, which Mr. Shankarik said is grades six through eight. So on the screen, you can see um, that we offer the MYP, which is what we usually say for short, um, along with Oakwood Middle School, which is in Statesville, serving the northern part of our county, and they used to be called Northview. Um, I'm actually the coordinator at both, so I'm very familiar with um, both schools. Um, courses and offerings and also um, histories of the program. But you can see that um, if you attended Cottle Creek Elementary in the PYP or primary years program, um, that is one potential pathway that students can take to enter the MYP, but it is not required um, to have participated in the PYP um, before coming to our school, um, which offers the MYP, the middle years program. Um, the middle years program is actually a five-year program, which for our students continues at South Iredell High School. So we have the first three years of the MYP at our campus, grades six, seven, and eight. Um, if students um, choose to continue in the MYP, they will go to South Iredell High School for years four and five of the MYP, which is ninth and 10th grade. The full continuum of the IB and Idle Statesville schools does span all the way to 12th grade. Um, so you can see there um, for 11th and 12th grades, um, it continues with something called the diploma program and also the career program. And those um, are offered at South Idaho High School. Uh, one really exciting point of note for our district is um, it's been a goal to offer the full K-12 IB continuum in both the northern and southern parts of our county. Um, and you can see there, um, uh, Statesville High School is pursuing uh, candidacy to offer the MYP, um, hopefully in the near future. So um, stay tuned about that. But that would not affect anyone um, down here in the southern part. So if you were one of those elementary schools that Mr. Shankarik mentioned, um, you would be uh, in our um, zone for residency in our location. Yep, and I will also add to um, that if um, sometimes, you know, people get locked in and I think that they have to continue in the, the program this year, um, I, I should say last year, any each year we have about somewhere between half and 
um, probably three fourths of our students continue on to South Iredale High School. And it really depends on the cohort of students. Sometimes more go to South, sometimes, um, um, you know, it's 50-50 between South and Lake Norman. Um, and actually in growing popularity in our district are, is the early college program as well too, which students um, are interested in. Um, so it's a pretty cool opportunity experience that we provide. Um, so, you know, our hope is that kids will continue in the um, middle years program and, for, and finish that, but it, it doesn't always happen that way. Um, and that's okay. It's all about uh, choice and options and what works best. Um, so I, I thought we'd take a break right here and just uh, have a couple of our students kind of chime in, or maybe I'll start with just Abby right now. Uh, why did you choose to attend an IB school? So I came from Cottle Creek Elementary School and I did the IB program there. So that would be the PYP into MYP. And I found that I really liked the challenge that that happened when I came here. I always liked coming to school and actually being able to translate what I learned in class to actually what was going on around me. And that was really cool because when I went from Cottle Creek to here, it really, I got like a really good experience of, okay, so I learned this and I can put this in real world examples and I can use this in real life, which I think that would be really good. Like going into high school and especially if I were to do the early college program, I could use that in problem solving anywhere, really in any real life problem, which is what I think is really good about the school. Okay. And uh, Abby, what um, high school are you planning? Or are you hoping to attend next year? I'm planning to go to South and continue the IB program, but I'm also considering going to the, um, the early college. Um, I applied there and I'm going to see if I get in. Mm -hmm. Cool. And what about you, Beckham? Where are you planning to continue school next year? Um, so because my family is like a Lake Norman school, I want to go to South, but I'm going to either go to Lake Norman or I also signed up for the early college. So I'm hoping I get into that. So cool. All right. Thank you. Um, so we've heard a little bit um, from the students. That was awesome. And by the way, we did not tell them what to say. Um, this is just uh, their responses. Um, but what is IB? It stands for International Baccalaureate. And um, one of the really awesome things being an IB school is that um, we offer the same framework that any IB school around the entire world offers. So it's really neat to be a part of a, a really global community. So that's um, a really a neat thing. Um, the picture on this slide actually was a recent photograph from one of our sixth grade classes. Um, they have these moon maps and uh, I know it might be hard to see on your screen. Um, it's very interactive, project-based. That's one of the really neat things about um, the way we implement our curriculum. Um, it's not a lot of written paper tests. It's a lot of um, collaboration, as you can see the students in that photo, um, hands-on activities, uh, real-world application, like Abby mentioned, um, just a lot of different um, unique and varied opportunities for our students um, in their IB course of study. Um, the IB mission statement is something that I think is really important to, to review uh, in any of these informational meetings because it really at the heart of what we do as a school. Um, we're charged with developing, inquiring, knowledgeable, and caring young people who help create a better world, uh, a better and more peaceful world through education that builds intercultural understanding and respect. So some key words in there, of course, an international um, multicultural type experience for all of our students. We'll talk a little bit about global perspectives that we add to all of our lessons. Um, we're always challenging students to uh, make the world a better place. Sometimes that's in a small way or in a more local way. And sometimes uh, we have big global ideas um, that we do that with. Sometimes we do it through learning and sometimes we do it through action. Um, and we'll talk about some of that here in just a little bit too. Um, when, because we do that, oftentimes uh, a saying that I use uh, sometimes is to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So oftentimes we'll try to place students in some situations or have them kind of discuss things that might be uh, a different point of view or a different perspective um, than that what they're used to. We're certainly not trying to uh, change 
um, the opinions of people or, or, or whatever it might be, but we're trying to get students to understand other perspectives and understand that other people can also be right, um, which is another part of the IB philosophy. And so sometimes our learning um, activities and, and, and things that we do in the classroom will um, ask students um, to kind of push them into some conversations or encounter topics, novels and things that may not experience in a traditional classroom setting and, um, and in hopes that they will become more global thinkers, problem solvers, and um, again, consider other perspectives with their learning. So um, that to me is exciting and um, a big part of what we do as a school and, and one of the things that separates us from a traditional middle school. Um, now, the IB's middle programs offers an academic challenge. So these are really four areas that are specific to IB schools. If you're new to IB, um, these things um, are probably unique to you, to, to you or uh, the learning that you're familiar with. I think the first one there on the left, that first column is our core classes. This is probably, um, in my opinion, um, one of the biggest differences between our school and a traditional middle school. All of our students take eight classes, um, and uh, that's a huge um, task for an 11-year-old when they start middle school. Um, so we have English language and literature, um, so that's like our ELA class, individuals and society, which is social studies, uh, math, science, a world language, art, design, and PE. Um, so ELA is the a same that anyone else would be familiar with as well as individual societies, math and science. World language is probably the first one that separates us or makes us different. Um, we offer three different world languages at our school. We offer French, Spanish, and Mandarin Chinese. Um, and so what will happen during the application is you'll uh, pick one of those choices. You'll actually kind of rank those. We try to give everyone their first choice. We're not always able to do that. Um, but we do try to uh, have your first choice or at least your second choice for one of those. Of course, Spanish tends to be our most popular um, and our, the one that we have the most students enrolled at. And then Spanish and, I'm sorry, French and Chinese um, kind of make up the, are about equal um, for the next popular. Uh, the idea though, is that when students take these classes for three years and you'll actually take that world language for three years, when you finish our school, you actually leave with the high school credit. So uh, Beckham and Abby are going to move to high school next year, and they'll have their freshman level um, world language. Um, I know, Beckham, you're in Chinese, correct? Abby, what are you in? I do Spanish. Spanish. Yep. So both of them are going to go on to high school and have Chinese one, and Abby will have Spanish one completed, and they'll start Chinese two and Spanish two when they get to high school. So that part's really exciting too. The next one there, art, is another one that's significant at our school. Um, our art program is uh, actually our biggest fundraiser that we do. We do a program called Showcase in the Art. So it's a really uh, popular thing here at our school. It's considered a core class at our school, um, meaning that you spend as much time in your fine art class as you do in English class. I know uh, Abby's in drama. So she's going to spend as much time in her drama class as she does in her English class. And Beckham's in band, and uh, Beckham's going to spend as much time in band as he does his science class. They're all considered core classes. We put value into all of those courses all the same. Um, our classes are about 85 minutes. Um, and like I said, it's an A-day, B-day schedule. So we take uh, four classes on an A-day, four classes on a B-day. So today was a A day, am I right? Yes, today was an A day. So you take your four A day classes, tomorrow will be a B day, you'll take your four B day classes, and then Wednesday you'll have, have the classes you had from Monday and it'll repeat. Um, so that's how we do four classes. The next class I have up there is design, which is our computer tech ed class, which means they do some things in there. Sixth grade does a ton of coding. I know um, um, eighth grade um, does some pretty cool design projects. Um, so they do like STEM activities um, and they work through the design cycle, which is an IB specific um, thing that we do as well. Um, and then last is PE and health. Um, and our students um, have that every other day. 
So again, I think the big thing in that column is that you take eight classes and that's challenging because you're gonna get less time in one of those classes. If you're at a traditional home middle school like Woodland Heights or Lakeshore Middle School, you'll have math every day um, at our school uh, or you'll have ELA every day. So if you're a struggling reader or uh, somebody that doesn't, you know, needs that kind of uh, uh, touch every single day at our school, it, it would be very demanding for you because not only are you struggling at reading, but you also have to pick up another, a second language as well, too. So it goes back to that academic challenge that, that's provided at our school. Um, and then there's criteria for success, and I'll let Ms. White talk about that. So the remaining three columns on this slide really are at the heart of what makes instruction different within those core classes that Mr. Shinkarik just mentioned. Um, so like I said before, part of being an IB school is we have um, the same criteria for success given by IB because we're an IB school. So our teachers have to kind of um, use two things in their instruction. Yes, we teach the North Carolina Standard Course of Study just like any other um, public school in the state of North Carolina, but um, we do that within the IB framework work and that is what is the same at any IB school. So um, students aren't just learning uh, math or science as indicated um, by the state to be required, um, but the IB gives us rubrics and um, sixth grade, you don't, you don't have to be an expert on this. Um, our sixth grade teachers are amazing and they'll, they'll help um, explain what's required for each class. We're not gonna get into all of that um, today, but there are IB rubrics for each class and um, they focused on not just getting the right answer, but also how did you arrive at that right answer? Um, like the design class that Mr. Shinkarik mentioned, um, the process of how you design and think about solving a problem or creating something is just as important as what you come up with at the end. And that would be the same like for math or science as well. Um, it's not just about getting the right answer, but how did you actually think through that and get arrive at the right answer? Maybe um, the thinking was just as important as, um, as where you ended up at the end. So we have the same IB rubrics um, as any IB school around the world. Um, the next one, learning through inquiry. Um, our teachers have um, a very specific unit planning process that they follow. And so all of the units that your students will experience are guided by something called a statement of inquiry. And that is a big overarching question. Um, things having to do with like change or communities or how we function together or how one part of a system affects another system. So it, it goes beyond just teaching the content, but really getting students to think um, beyond the class. Um, this helps them make connections from one class to another. Um, also helps them make connections to uh, real world or real life. Um, like at the beginning, um, Abby mentioned, you know, solving problems and um, real world situations like that is intentionally done by our teachers and it creates um, different forms of assessments too, which is uh, the last column on this slide. Um, we tend to be more project based and collaborative than a traditional classroom. Uh, students often have to work in groups. It's not all group work, you know, of course, there's a place for independent study. Um, our teachers really take the role of facilitator and helping guide students through thinking about things working together. And we'll talk a little bit more about approaches to learning um, here in just a minute, but that's another um, tool in our toolkit that helps students be successful in, in different sorts of situations. Um, so beyond academics, um, a big part of the IB philosophy is developing the whole student. So it's not just about content. Yes, we have to teach content, but IB is more concerned about um, developing people as people. So if you think back to the, the beginning when Mr. Shinkarik was talking about, um, you know, raising and building capacity in students to be caring people that can make a positive difference in the world, the things on this screen are the strategic things in place to help make sure that um, we can help do that and, and produce good citizens. Uh, we have something called the learner profile traits. And those are 10 words that um, gives our teachers and our students a common language of things that we strive to be. So if you look at that list, um, being a, an inquirer, and that's not just asking questions all the time, but it's really like reflecting and thinking about what you're learning and really taking it to heart, asking good questions, being knowledgeable, um, being a thinker, um, risk taker, uh, just the fact that you're attending tonight shows that you um, have some element of being a risk taker, you know, you're up for a challenge um, and being reflective. That is also a, a huge part of every class and every decision um, is just being reflective. And I know that can sometimes be a challenge um, in middle school, but um, our teachers are amazing and, and try to build in time for reflecting on the content and the, 
the um, content that they're teaching. Um, next is the global context. Um, all of the units um, are filtered through one of these six global contexts, um, fairness and development, globalization and sustainability, science and technical innovation, personal and cultural expression, and identities and relationships. So those kind of just look like a bunch of words on the page, but this really creates the, okay, I'm learning this in class, but why should I care about it? That's really what these global contexts do. They help take something that, um, you know, might just be kind of ordinary every day and it um, helps them apply it to different situations. So for instance, fairness and development, um, instead of just learning about water, you know, a teacher in science class might um, take an approach looking at, okay, um, not just about the water and the water cycle, um, but let's talk about access to clean water. Um, what do people in different parts of the world have to do to have clean water? Is it a right? Is it a privilege? Like, how does that work? And so that's the um, approach. They'll take one of those um, six approaches in the global context for all of their units. Approaches to learning. I love the approaches to learning. I think this is one of the coolest things about IB. I know I'm a little biased, um, but this is basically the tools that have nothing to do with content. Um, it's not math or science specific, but it's things that we need to be successful human beings. Um, it's things like being um, organized, which I know um, when sixth graders come in, sometimes they need a lot of support, sometimes even eighth grade or even adults, you know, we still need support with organization, uh, managing our time, um, communicating, you know, what, what's an appropriate way to communicate, how can we um, interact well with people around us, um, different perspectives like Mr. Shankarik mentioned earlier, um, being able to um, disagree peacefully sometimes and communicate. Um, research, informational literacy, just all the things that you would need to do, not just as a student, but also as an adult. Um, our teachers really strive to help students grow um, with all of these and we call them approaches to learning. Lastly, service is action. Um, Community service is usually what you'd, we, you'd call this in a non-IB school. So um, serving others is very important, no matter which level of the, of the IB that you're participating in. Um, and it's looked diff different ways. Uh, we have to tweak it a little bit each year um, just with everything going on. But um, service learning is really important. Um, our teachers do this. Sometimes they will offer ideas that come up like from units they're teaching, but all of our students participate um, in service to the community. Um, and this year they are reflecting and planning uh, through modules in Canvas and then getting out into the community um, or doing more um, indirect service such as advocacy. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can serve and it's really neat to see um, passions develop in our students. Uh, a lot of times in sixth grade, sometimes people see this part of the presentation and they think, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know where I would serve or what, what I could do. But that's part of what we do is we try to help students find their passions and things that they can really get excited about um, in helping their, their local or global community. And I'll add too um, that I think sometimes people value in a school, you talk about what's a priority, what do you value in a school? Are you, are you interested in the highest performing school Right. Well, I, you know, I alluded to that earlier is that we've we've done that and we've historically been one of the top performing middle schools in the state. Um, and then some people really value kind of this more holistic approach and value art and building good citizens. And it's more important to have a school that values those things. Right. Which I really think about our school um, is that we we were able to do both of those things. We're able to be. Um, very high performing in a rigorous, challenging school environment, um, but we also put a ton of emphasis on learner profile traits and building good citizens and having them learn about the world around them. The ATLs thing, like uh, Ms. White said, is one of my favorite things because it teaches kids how to learn uh, is the idea behind that is how to be, you know, oftentimes we say in some schools we'll say, well, go study or uh, get organized where ATLs are teaching us how to teach kids to do these things. So. Um, that part is, is um, super exciting to me. So uh, go back to our students here. Um, I, you know, the last two slides that we've talked about is about the, the core classes and, and how the teachers build these lessons and, and all of these things in global context. So um, I just wanted to ask uh, Beckham and Abby, what are assign what assignments or project um, have you done recently that was really exciting to you? And I'll, I'll start with Beckham. So uh, an assignment or project that's been like I mean, really exciting to me recently is something called the Sully Newscast Summative in Social Studies. 
it's basically where you take this like Native American like leader, or his name's Sully, and he's from the Cherokee tribe. But um, but there's two different sides of the story about how he basically fought back against the government, and he was sort of um, an activist. And um, it's really you know like fun because it's also a group project. So in my group since there's two different sides of the story, it's like, you kind of, you have to do it, but you have to make it not biased, but you have to make it like good supporting, you know, like both sides. And it's just, it's really fun to do it with the group because you can all share your opinions and you can all like decide, hey, this is what we're gonna do. And like, um, you all have a part in it. And it's just like, it was really fun. And so. And, and I like that example too, because um, a lot of times, like Beckham's example there, that's his summative. So that was the assessment to the end of um, his unit um, and it's assessed one of those criterion, but it isn't, whereas a lot of schools will do a multiple choice test, um, this is uh, different. So, you know, he's, we're asking him to kind of apply what he's learned um, in that course to this group project. So great example, Beckham. Beckham, are you a history guy? Um, yeah, I'd say that's probably my favorite or just one of my favorite classes because, um, I like the fact that like, there's so many different things that's happened and it's sort of like, for me, whenever I learn about something new, I like try in my mind to put myself in that situation. I try to use my creativity to like map it out how I think it would look. And then when I actually see it, I'm like, I compare it and I'm like, Oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. And it's like, yeah, you, you learn a lot from that too. So it's like, I, I love social studies. Plus Miss Russell is awesome. Okay. All right. And then Abby, do you have an example or two? I second that. Miss Russell is awesome. I like that. <laughs> um, well, uh, just like Beckham said, we usually do summatives at the end of our units. In science right now, we're actually looking at energy sustainability and we're looking at that through terms of the United Nations and like what they say makes an energy source sustainable, which is really cool because my group in science is doing nuclear energy, which we actually have a nuclear power plant like right next to us, which is really cool because we actually got to research stuff in our area that can look we can look at is this sustainable according to the regulations of the United Nations like Real, like the way that is and it's really cool how like we can look at well we have this in our area and we can actually use the stuff we're learning to see does this really harm our community or does it benefit from our community and we get to learn a lot about like why like some death rates are some high and some cancers are more common it's really cool how we get to like use it in the real world <laughs> Cool. Oh, and we're also doing in math one, we did this really cool project where we're using linear functions to make our name in Desmos. Beckham, did you do that? That was really hard. Like <laughs> we spent so much time in that and quadratic equations and stuff like that. It was difficult, but it was really fun to do. <laughs> well, you had to put like over like 120 equations in there. Just yeah. it's, yeah, it was like really cool because it wasn't like, oh, you have to draw like straight lines, like straight down and like, hey, there's your name. No, you had to like put like art into it and you had to. Like, like an actual design. I made mine a candy cane. My name, Abby, is a candy cane in there. <laughs> I made mine sort of like a neon light sort of thing. That's cool. <laughs> but yeah. All right. Okay, so great example. I appreciate that. I didn't, uh, again, we didn't, we didn't probe them for that. And it sounds, I mean, you might say that's eighth grade, so it's a little bit more advanced, but we, I mean, we do some really cool projects in sixth grade. Um, I talked um, to our rising sixth graders at our, all of our feeder schools, our sixth graders, right before Thanksgiving, um, they dissected cow eyeballs. Um, our eighth graders, I think you guys did some like explosions and things. Yeah, um, we did. The, um, the some science center came and yeah. we did a bunch of stuff with um acids and bases and stuff like that it was really cool yep and then our seventh graders dissected frogs so our school was really smelly for those two days so i remember the um, cow eye it didn't smell very good at all <laughs> <laughs> okay 
Um, so this slide here is the international back of the right for your child. So, um, it, it, you know, you can see, obviously, um, our students that are going to really excel in our program are ones that are intellectually curious. It's my belief that that really that's inherent in kids. Um, kids are naturally curious. I think if they're not, um, they probably haven't found learning opportunities that really uh, push at those things. Of course, social media and technology makes it even more difficult for schools and education systems to, to be engaging and, and those types of things. Um, but I, I think you can hear the examples here. Um, I think we do a, a really well, a, a good job with that. Um, enjoy an academic challenge. Again, going back to what I had said before, eight courses, four on an A day, four on a B day, we move really quickly. Um, so you have to be invested into that academic challenge. Uh, take pride in completing schoolwork. I think both of these students will tell you that um, if you don't stay on top of those things and you get behind, it's really difficult to catch up um, because it moves quickly and you're on to the next thing. Um, so completing work in a timely fashion, um, having good organizational skills is going to be um, super important for you. Perform on grade level as shown through report cards and standardized tests. Um, and it goes, it has to do with the idea really of taking the number of courses and learning a second language. Um, now, those things, um, you know, standardized tests are not always the best measure of uh, students, and we understand that. Uh, again, that's why at the heart of what we do is, is a lot of our assessments aren't standardized tests and multiple choice. They're, we do those things, and our students do well on them, but in fact, we are actually assessing in, in different manners and, and methods um, than what a traditional school would do. So in comparison to traditional middle schools, our IB program requires students to take a world language. Um, they also have to take an art and design course um, each year of the program in addition to their core classes. Um, it is a more rigorous uh, um, program than a traditional um, school would be. Uh, and we also push in character development, approaches to learning, um, and then to have a service project as a part of the learning experience as well too. So um, I'd like to ask the kids, what was um, a learning experience or what did you like most about your middle school experience? You wanna go ahead, Abby. Um, so I really like how, since we're um, IB, our teachers, they always say B and IB is studiante. At least that's what um, Snor Principe says, our Spanish teacher. And so when she says B and IB is studiante, she's, she gives us freedom to, you can choose your groups, you can really put like, put what you want together with the freedom that you have. And she gives you some like guidelines on the assignments, but really it's cool how they let us work with our friends and we can get stuff done together because sometimes we collaborate better with some people that we're, we work better with. So I think that's really cool, the freedom that they give us. Yeah, and I would say too, and that we, we provide that because our students are able to handle that. Mm -hmm. um, some schools have to have a lot more structure um, because it, it, with, if it was too loose, it would it would not go well. But um, our students oftentimes have more freedom and and have uh, more opportunities because they've shown us to to be able to to meet that. And it really lets us be more creative when doing the assignments that we can like contribute to the real world problems and do like the service learning that goes along with it. Cool. All right. All right. So um, all of this comes to the application. So our, uh, our school requires an application for enrollment. Um, you will, um, depending on your address, um, wherever you're at, um, you will go to uh, likely your home middle school, which for most of you is Lakeshore Middle School or Woodland Heights Middle School. Um, so you have to opt into our program and that's through an application process. Um, and so through the application process, um, we hope to give you information on whether we feel like you're a good fit for our school. Uh, we're going to provide a recommendation. Previously, years ago, and we've actually done this application, I think this is our fourth year. Is that right, Ms. White? I think it's our third year. Is it our third year? Okay. Well, at any rate, we've done this application now for a few years and it seems to be working well for us. We're going to look at hard data and soft data. Our hard data, we look at really six data points, um, a math data point, 
um, it, for your EOG, a math data point for your check-in and a math data point for your iReady score. Um, and all of our feeder elementary schools will provide that for us. And then we'll also provide an ELA, EOG, ELA check-in and ELA iReady. We just take the most recent data point for each of those. So in all, there are six data points that we collect. If you're a home school, uh, I'm sorry, if you're, yeah, if you were homeschooled, private school or out of state, we still can uh, collect data. You just might, we just have to use whatever relevant data there might be. Um, we don't typically look at report card grades, although we can consider that as part of the application process. It's not one of our hard data points um, that we collect. Um, we'll certainly can look at that. And sometimes students that come from other schools, districts or states or school settings, non-traditional pathways, Montessori schools, all of that. Sometimes we have to look at some of these other data points to kind of fit our application and, um, and we can certainly make that accommodation. We also look at soft data, which is information that's found on the application. Primarily that's gonna be given to us through a survey that you and your child will do together. We're gonna to ask you questions about, you know, how do they learn best? Do, do they uh, learn well in cooperative groups? Since you've heard that quite a bit in today's presentation. Um, we'll also ask them um, if they uh, like to help other people um, or what's their organization skills like? Those are kind of soft data points that, that we'll collect as well. So we kind of mash all that together and then that will give us a recommendation. And it's, uh, we try to make it as uh, objective as possible. And um, we can't always do that. Um, and we, we, you know, we understand there is some subjectivity to all of this, um, but we do the best we can um, with that. And, um, and so uh, we certainly don't have the infrastructure uh, to do what a college admissions program would provide, but we do our best that we can. And at the end of the day, we're just trying to extend a recommendation and help you as a parent make a decision if you think this would be a good fit. Um, so I'll ask our students, what advice do you have uh, for any rising sixth grade students to the school? Just don't get in trouble necessarily and like just be yourself. All right, be yourself. Abby, do you have any advice? Um, I want to reiterate organization. I find it a lot easier to keep track of my work and remember what I um, submitted and what I haven't submitted or what I need help on. If I really organize, I find it's best to make lists. I love to make lists about like, I haven't completed my homework for math. I need to do this for social studies and I have this for science. It makes it a ton easier to get your workload like a little bit simpler for your like brain to understand. Because if you think about your day and you're like, oh my gosh, I, have, I missed this thing in science. I missed this thing in social studies. I need to do this thing for math. It gets overwhelming. So being organized and making lists and actually having the papers that you need that you can study for your for your exams, it's, it's really, it's easier if you're organized and you bring the correct folders to the correct days. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and we try to do a lot to help our sixth graders when they first start to help them because the eight courses is um, a big ask for our kids. Some of our uh, feeder schools, um, they're in the same classroom every day um, and don't switch classes at all. And then we drop them into a middle school and now they have eight classes. So that's really difficult. So we do a sixth grade transition camp and we try to prepare our students um, and help them and organizations. One of our approaches to learning skills that we try to embed into our lessons to help students. But but Abby's right, that organization piece, I think, is, is really um, a challenge for some, um, something that we'll try to help you with, but, um, but also you have to try to build a system that makes you prepared. Um, but one of the things that I think is really cool is that the feedback that I get from our students that go to high school is that they're prepared, they're ready. Um, and I think at the end of the day, that's our goal is to, to get them ready for high school. Um, and I think if they come through our program and do well in our program, they're ready for any option that is out there um, in our district for high school students. Um, so going back to our application and the recommendation levels. Um, so once we mash all of those data points, hard and soft data together, we really leave four options on our um, that will provide or four different levels that will provide to you with your application. And that's highly recommend, um, recommend, recommend with hesitation and do not recommend. And so students that have scored really well on all of those hard data points and uh, responded to that survey are gonna be extended to highly recommend 
and then we'll go all the way to do not recommend. Um, now, any of the highly recommend, recommend, and recommend with hesitation, um, you just, if you want to keep your spot for the school, then you would just submit that when you get your recommendation level and, um, and you're all set for attendance to our school. If you get a do not recommend, um, then what we're saying for there is that we don't believe that it would be a good fit. We feel like it would, you would really struggle. You could benefit from getting math and ELA every single day, which our, uh, your traditional middle schools are going to provide that. Um, if you would like to us to consider still enrollment into our school, um, then you can contact me um, and we'll set up a meeting and we'll discuss that um, and go through some of those data points. Sometimes a do not recommend could be a simple, something as simple as we were missing some data points. And so we do not recommend it because we just don't have enough data to be able to tell you if we recommend the school. So sometimes it's something as easy as that and we can kind of work through that through a meeting. And then sometimes um, we can have some honest conversations about what that might look like and some of the challenges are ahead. I would say that um, most people that have a do not recommend don't actually move forward with enrollment. Um, some do, um, and and you know we have some um, you know different results on how that works out. Um, so the next steps are um, is going to be our application enrollment, and so the idea here is is through the month of December is to kind of wet the whistle and get you excited and learn more about our program through our feeder elementary school visits. And of course, this informational night tonight, um, and then kind of discuss that over the holiday break. Um, and then we'll open the application on January 4th. All of our students that apply within that window um, and then are extended, one of those top three levels are guaranteed a spot into our school. So it's not so much uh, first come, first serve. So please do not log into the application at midnight on January 4th. It doesn't make you any more uh, possible to get into our school if you did it uh, two weeks later. Um, also, there's no lottery as well. Those are That's an old system that we used to have at our school. Um, so there isn't a, a lottery system either. We have enough space in our school to accommodate the number of students um, that will apply. This year in sixth grade, uh, we have just short of 230 students, maybe 220, somewhere around there. And uh, that's a sixth grade class. And we could accept, you know, over 250 sixth graders and still have enough space in our school. Um, part of the reason that we, our application window is there is because the scheduling part is really difficult with all the different offerings that we have as a middle school. Again, no middle school offers five different um, arts courses, and I, I should have mentioned that earlier, that we have five arts classes, orchestra, chorus, um, drama, band, and visual art. So we have five different art classes that our students can pick from, and of course, three different foreign languages. So the we're really running like a high school schedule for our students, and so it's the application and doing this process ahead of time allows us to prepare and make sure we have staffing that matches the needs of our students. Um, so that's really the next step is an application window will open on January 4th through January 28th. You have to have that completed by January 28th. So just as long as it's done within the month of January, um, we'll take, it'll take us some time to process through all of that application and then extend our recommendations. Um, and um, also our recommendations aren't based on the cohort, um, but are based on the data. So um, sometimes I know that was one question I've had before is that people you know, thought, well, we just take the top 10% and make them is you know, highly recommend. It doesn't work that way either. Um, so um, any questions about our application process or if you're having trouble with the application or want any kind of information about that, uh, Lindsay Riebling is our data manager and she will manage all of the application systems with you. Once you complete your application, it will, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lindsay, it will extend a, uh, you will get a confirmation email immediately after submitting your application. That is correct. Okay. And I believe that's our last slide. So at this point, um, I will take a look at the um, chat here and answer any questions that we might have. When do we receive feedback recommendation? The recommendations, we usually take the month of February to process through the recommendations and sometime in March is when we would mail out 
um, an application. So it's like every month there's a different thing. January is the application window. February is when we process all the information. March is when we send out the uh, letters. And then you have until April to um, give us your confirmation if you're coming to us or going to another school. Actually, that um, acceptance or the recommendation letters will start going out on February 21st. All right, faster and than then you have a chance to give us your response from February 28th through March 25th. Okay. Uh, there was one question ahead of that, though. Could you tell us about the clubs that are offered? Yeah, we offer a ton of clubs and every year is a little bit different. Um, so I'll try to name some of them that we offer and, and kids, you can jump in and help me out if I'm missing anything. But we do uh, Battle of the Books, which we have one of the very successful Battle of the Books. Abby, didn't you do Battle of the Books or used to maybe? I did. We won. That was yeah. that was a really awesome. We, our Battle of the Books team is by far the best middle, middle school <laughs> team that I've seen in the Iredell State School Schools. We yeah. won like... It was crazy, the points yeah. above. <laughs> yeah, so we're really good at that Battle of the Books. Um, we also have um, a couple of different quiz type. We have um, Quiz Bowl, Science Olympiad. Sometimes it depends on the number of um, sponsors or club sponsors that we have. Um, we just started last year a Poetry Aloud Club where uh, students can practice and recite poems in kind of a, a more of like a theater-based environment. Um, we have Odyssey the Mind this year, Robotics, um tinkers debate tinkers, yep uh, we also cool. have spanish national exam which is that's a really really big one this year that's super popular and i'm actually the leader of that so we we do have a lot of mm -hmm. good stuff like that yep yep for spanish Your book and math counts all right there it is okay um, there was a question there. Is it open for students that are out of district yes it's open for students that are out of district um, there's the, uh, collecting the data is a little bit different and Lindsay can work with you on, on your out of district application. And the application is actually set up where you can, it'll have a spot in there to specify if you're out of district and, um, there'll be some next steps that you'll just com complete the application. And then Lindsay will follow up behind you to ask for some data points if we're not going to get them directly. Did you want to add anything to that, Lindsay? Um, no, that's. Perfect. The question above that, though, was do students from Cottle Creek that are in the PYP need to apply? And the answer to that is yes. Any student who is wishing to attend our school needs to complete the application. Yeah. Um, sports programs that we offer, we offer all of the sports that any traditional middle school will offer with the exception of, I believe, two sports, and it might only be one sport next year. In the fall, we offer... Um, cross country, boys and girls cross country. It's our most popular sport. We have about 80 students that run cross country. Um, and there's no tryout for that. If you, if you want to run, you, we, you run. Um, we also offer a JV and varsity volleyball in the fall. If you want to play football, then you have to go to either Woodland Heights or Lakeshore, your home middle school to compete to play football, we don't offer football. The same is true if you want to be a cheerleader in the fall sport, a fall season, you would have to uh, try out and go to your home school for that. In the winter, we offer boys and girls JV and varsity basketball, as well as cheerleading. We just added cheerleading this year as a winter sport. Um, and then we, if you want to wrestle, again, you have to go to Woodland Heights or to Lakeshore. We are working towards having a wrestling team for next year. We do feel like we have enough interest from our students um, and our Boosters Club is working to, to make that an opportunity for our students in the winter. And in the spring, we offer boys and girls soccer as well as baseball and softball. So it's all of the district sports um, that are offered within any other school in the district. Um, do we use the website currently showing on the screen to find the application? The application will go live on January 4th, and the link will be found directly on the front website, the web page. You want to add anything to that, Lindsay? Nope, that's exactly where it will be. Yep. 
uh, where we'll be able to find the recording of this presentation and our, where the slides will be made available. The slideshow is actually a part of the application. You have to go through the slideshow. There's a couple little changes that we added for this program. It's the same slideshow that they're going to use at Oakwood as well, too. So it might look a little bit different. There's also a video that we ask parents to watch. We really want parents to understand what they're signing up for. There's a lot of misconceptions on what it means to be an IB school. You know, we, we have this, um, I guess it's a good uh, reputation, but it's not accurate is that this is a school, you know, this is just the school uh, where smart kids go, right? Or this is the school where they give all the homework or whatever it might be. Um, that isn't what we stand for. And hopefully you saw through our presentation that it's not about that. It's about building global citizens. It's about citizenship and, um, and, and helping improve the world. And there is rigor involved in it and adding a second language and, and all of those things, but that's more the heart of who we are. Um, do you accept applicants for seventh and eighth graders or only incoming sixth graders? We accept them for all grade levels. It gets a little tricky um, with seventh and eighth graders coming in because of the foreign language requirements. Our hope is that kids will finish eighth grade with a high school credit. So if they come in a little bit later, sometimes we have to do some interesting things or some little unique plans to get them prepared for high school with that high school foreign language um, uh, credit. Um, but we work through that every single year. We have students that come in at seventh and eighth grade, the same application process. They do have to apply within that window. Is there a beta club? We do not offer, uh, we do not have a beta club. Um, we found the beta club kind of emphasized uh, high grades and, and, and straight A's and things like that. We don't even um, recognize students on A and B honor roll that we actually focus more on improvement and, and these other ideas. We do a student government though, that does a lot of service around our school and our community. And, um, and so sometimes, I, I know that's a component of beta club. And so sometimes they'll do, that's kind of our, that's our version of beta club. Um, is the curriculum driven by Ardell State School or IBO? Does IBO regulate the school in any way? Liz, that's all you. <laughs> Um, so we follow the um, state requirements as far as curriculum goes. So um, that part would be the same as any traditional public school. Um, it is different, obviously, for different content areas with the standard course of study. Um, so that's the same. Um, to be an IB World School, um, there are certain requirements that you have to have in place, um, whether you're an IB school in the United States or anywhere around the world. Um, so we do with, work within the required framework um, to make sure that we're um, that we're working on all of the things that IB says that we need to have in place as well. So it's, it's kind of like we do both. I would not use the word um, regulate the school, um, but we do follow their framework um, in guiding our instruction and different practices um, within the school. And that, um, that's, you know, what makes us an IB school. If we didn't have things um, that we did differently, you know, we would just be um, a traditional school. Yeah, that was good. That was a good question. That was a teacher that gave that question. So I knew she, that was a, definitely a teacher question. <laughs> uh, what are transportation options? We provide transportation if you live within our boundaries. So if you live um, if you're an out of district student, for example, if you are in uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg, we've, we do have students that come from Davidson to our school. We've had students that come to us from uh, Lincoln County before. If you're coming out of Mooresville graded, we have lots of kids that come from Mooresville graded. We do not provide transportation for those students, but we do provide transportation for students that are within our boundaries. And again, it comes down to a shuttle option or a direct route. Um, we do not offer, oh, is there a stool council? There's a, we have our student government, SGA, we call it. Um, somebody asked about comparing our school to Pine Lake in terms of academics, aside from not being an IB school. Uh, I, I would, it, I don't know enough about the um, Pine Lake to, to probably answer that question. Um, I would probably encourage you to compare our presentation to, to their presentation and, and what they do that what they do there. Um, I will say that we've outperformed every local regional option um, in our areas. So we've outperformed every charter school and every state school that has state data that we can compare to. Um, we JR have yeah, JROTC. Yep, we don't have JROTC in high school. 
I believe South Iredell has that, Lake Norman does not, but they start those programs in high school. Is choosing a language a rigid, rigid, rigid approach? For example, if a student thinks he wants to start with French, but after one or two months changes his mind, can they switch? Um, uh, we do not recommend that because it then becomes hard. You're, you're very far behind. Um, we've, we've accommodated some of the switching early on, uh, but we really hope that students will um, stick with their language and complete that for three years. Um, and you don't have to do that when you go to high school. Some students go to high school and pick up a different language. I know some of our students went to South Iredale and they offered Latin and they moved out of their language and switched to Latin. You can do that. Um, and I want to also uh, mention too that when you go to high school, you get credit for that course, but it does not impact your GPA. It does not, it, it will go on your transcript. Um, but you don't start, you know, if you got an A in Chinese, you don't go to high school with a 4.0. You'll go to high school with the Chinese credit. Um, and they can look on your transcript to see what grade you had there. But it won't, it won't um, be something that impacts your GPA. Since organization is such a big thing, does your school offer recommend certain planners agendas to be used by students? Um, we use Canvas as an online, mod, uh, online platform for uh, managing any of our assignments and things. So everything is on Canvas for students. Um, and we also encourage parents to become Canvas observers and have access to the parent portal so they can follow grades and such. Um, so we do offer that um, as a recommendation. Um, every student kind of builds their own system. Like, like Abby was saying, she's kind of built a system for her. I know some students use like the electronic sticky notes on their desktop. Some students rely very heavily on Canvas to locate all of their information. Um, some students that have trouble with organization, uh, quite honestly, their parents help manage that and help uh, work with them um, to build those systems in place. And again, as school, um, it's our responsibility to help with that as well, too. Um, so we, we kind of work with, with students on that. Um, you mentioned that topics that are not covered in traditional schools may be covered here. Can you give some examples? In Abby's example on uh, sustainability, like that isn't something that's directly within the eighth grade science curriculum. I'm a former middle school science teacher, so I'm pretty familiar with uh, those curriculum standards and I know that that isn't something that's directly taught there so they so so obviously that that's a very IB heavy assignment um, that pulls in the standard course of study of North Carolina curriculum that every student in a traditional middle school would do but then also this component of examining um, you know with the United Nations and, and, and building that into a science classroom I would say that that's an example of something not covered in a traditional school how much time is there between classes? Is there downtime at all during the day? Our classes are 85 minutes long. This year we have five minutes in between classes. Um, so we'll likely have three minutes in between classes because we find that five minutes is too long. Um, so next year we'll probably have three minutes in between classes. Um, there's downtime built in. Our, their lunch block is 25 minutes, I believe, or 30 minutes for lunch. There is some downtime at lunch too. I will say the students do have an opportunity to kind of sit where they want and kind of move around a little bit and meet with friends and things. Um, so that would be the, the place there. And then um, during the classroom, you know, this isn't something that I think the students would agree. If you guys would agree to that, the student teachers aren't standing up lecturing for 85 minutes. There is time transition between assignments and things like that to kind of move around and, and have discussions and such. Would you agree with that? At other schools, you might have teachers like talking about one subject and dragging it on, trying to like trying to sort of engrave it into your mind. But our teachers have a way of doing that. But it's like in very short on like a very short amount of time, probably about like maybe 20 minutes. And then you get a lot of like class to work on that. And then you might have homework time, depending on how fast you get it done. Mm -hmm. So. Especially it's in like social studies, Miss Russell really does a good job of making a story out of the out of the stuff. So it's not necessarily a lecture. It's more like she stands up and talks and help us helps us to understand like the material because of how the story is, and she explains the points of view behind it. Yeah, cool. 
Right. Uh, you mentioned, oh, is there a list of all the class choices online for us to pursue, such as the five art classes you mentioned? That's all part of the application. So when there, you get through the application, you'll actually you'll see those course options. The ones that they have the choices in are going to be in, in the arts and then in foreign language. And a part of that application, you'll be able to choose between those um, classes there. So you'll see them there. The other classes are standard. Um, some schools offer advanced courses. So like math, sixth grade, you'll have a regular math class and an advanced math class. All of our classes are considered advanced. We don't offer um, the, the, the other one, one option. Only in math in eighth grade does that change. So we do offer eighth grade math and math one. Uh, math one is a high school level math course. You mentioned early college, I might have misunderstood, but are there classes offered only in high school for college credits, or does that start in middle school? Um, the early, the, no, that we offer, um, our students can leave with two credits for high school, and that is math one and their foreign language. So anything that's going to build for college credit would be done at high school. And it's not just the early college that offers that, South Iredale and Lake Norman both offer college um, level courses as well. Any type and, of video? Go ahead, yeah, Abby. The, um, the early college, it's, um, that's CCTL, Crossroads, and ASEC are your options for that. And you only have to worry about what, that once you get in eighth grade. But me, like I'm considering going to it and that actually be on a college campus. And you take your high school classes at the same time that you take your college classes. So that's, you're not gonna be able to get any of those. Like they're already cramming that in a short period of time. So you're not gonna be able to get any of those here. This is just math one and your foreign language, which I do math one and foreign language. So I'll get those, those high school credits. She's well on her way. Don't grow up too fast, Abby, right? Is there any type of Lego class offered? We do not offer any club like that. You can find somebody to sponsor it and we'll add that club. Robotics kind of works with Legos a little bit. Yeah, it's yeah, that's true. That's first Lego league, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, can you tell us what Woodland Heights Middle received for their scoring? I see yours is a 90.5. I don't, ha I could probably find that for you. All of that data is available online um, and you can search any of that information. Does your school provide devices, laptops to your students? Yes, our district just refreshed the devices for next year. So all middle school students next year will receive an iPad with a keyboard. Our students currently this year have a MacBook. I mean, high school students will have a MacBook, um, but then um, our device next year will be iPads with keyboards. Um, but it is a personal device that students will take home. And that is that becomes your textbook, essentially. Um, Miss the answer about Cottle Creek. Yes, Cottle Creek will apply just like any other feeder school. Is there an EOC EOI exam that requires a passing score for language course in order to get credit for high school? Um, it's not an EOC, um, but our students do have a, uh, any high school credit course will have a final exam. Um, and so there will be a part of, of that um, in order for the high school credit. Do you recommend this school for students heavily involved in competitive club sports outside of school? That's a great question. I think it really depends on the student and how well they're able to, to balance that. Um, I know uh, Abby's probably a good answer for this because she, I know she stays pretty busy um, outside of school. And I think it really just depends on the student. Some students can manage that really well and have systems in place to do that. And some students may, may not be able to do that. Yeah, so I do competitive cheerleading. And some people have like opinions about this, that cheerleading is not a sport. But when I tell you, I put so much time into competitive cheerleading. I mean, I have practice right after this. So when we when, when we go on competition weekends and I have practice after school, it's manageable. I, it's, it's, a, it's hard, but it's manageable. And as long as your student, like your, your kid can manage your time well and, and um, get, your, their, get their homework done and do stuff that they need to do in class, it's, it's very, it's, it's okay. It'll be all right. <laughs> You'll be able to do it. <laughs> okay. All right, are classrooms fun and learning and are there pop quizzes? 
I think our learning is fun at our school. I hope I gave some examples of how learning is fun. As far as pop quizzes, I don't know so many times that our teachers um, would have any type of pop quiz. Um, on average, how long do students spend doing homework in the evenings? And again, this is really dependent on the student. Some of our students will say, I was talking to a student to say, say they hadn't had any homework all year. And then I, sometimes I talk to students and they have, you know, more than an hour's worth of homework. Um, I think that sometimes you can expect there is going to be work outside of school because again, as I said before, you're going to have half the amount of time in a class when you only have ELA every other day, there's no way you can get through that whole curriculum without um, having to move quickly and sometimes doing work outside of school. Um, so all of those things come at a cost. So it really depends on the student. My goal is to is is never to exceed um, an hour or an hour and a half worth of work outside of school um, in the evenings. Can I add one thing to that? Yeah. Um, because a lot of times things are project based or sort of larger projects over time. Um, if students don't have those built in processes, um, like Abby specifically mentioned, and you all you hear is maybe the teacher saying this isn't due for two weeks. Um, and maybe you kind of tune out the part that says, you know, like you should be working on one one part of that each day for the two weeks, then like the night before you will have, you know, five hours or three hours, however long. Um, so that's why those um, organization skills are important and really being um, developing the discipline to sort of work on things throughout and not um, procrastinating until the last minute. And we have criterions that really help us with the progress on that because there's A, B, C, and D. And like Ms. White said, we'll get into that, like whenever you actually get here, but it, they really help you to like structure, like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to build up to this? How am I going to think about this? It, it really helps once you get to the criterions. Good example. Yeah. Just try to pace it out. All right. That's all the questions I see in the chat. Um, if you didn't want to put in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all of our parents uh, for attending. We hope to see some of those applications start coming in on January 4th. I also want to thank Beckham and Abby for uh, spending their, uh, their evening doing this when they probably could be doing homework or competitive cheer. Uh, um, so I appreciate them taking time. Um, and, and of course, Ms. White, Ms. Riebling, you know, it's our job to do this, but the kids took time out of their evening to do it. So we appreciate everybody. Thank you so much. Have a good evening and uh, we hope to see you next year.